Warm welcome to this episode two of Rule the Waves 3, playing Germany from 1935 onwards. In episode one, we had a look at the wider context in which we had the fleet and looked at some of the terrible designs that we've been given as a legacy fleet and had a bit of a muse about what should we be doing about that. Now we're going to roll up our sleeves and get stuck in because at the start of any Rule the Waves game, there is a lot to do. Here is my little to-do list. So first of all, we need to shape the fleet or begin to shape the fleet into the structure that we want going forward. So obviously number one is the decision around the battleship Wettin and Deutschland under construction, which we've had a poll around and I'll announce the results shortly. Super interesting. I love this format of posing a problem and getting your collective wisdom into uh, into the feedback loop. Lots of interesting comments, uh, lots of votes. I couldn't be happier. This is exactly what I'd love for my channel. So thank you to everybody who's participated so strongly in that. We did identify that we don't have any mine sweeping, although we do have considerable mine laying capability. So that needs addressing. We need to set up the divisions. Divisions are a new feature within Rule the Waves 3 that allow you to structure your fleet to operate in a certain way. Uh, so that needs doing. We need to decide if we're going to put anything into reserve or anything into mothballs for the ships and of course for the aircraft in service. We need to do, decide whether we're going to deploy to the North Sea, which is where we're currently based, or go across to the Baltic, where some interesting opportunities may arise for seizing extra territory. Um, and I'm minded to s design and build a light carrier. Several of you commented that in order to push forward carrier operations, you really needed a carrier to give research a boost. I'm not, um, that is true back in the 1920s. I'm not absolutely sure that's true now. I, I suspect that that's already happened, but just in case, I'd love to build a light carrier and also to give the battle fleet uh, integral cap. That just seems like a gratuitously good thing. That's how I want to shape the fleet. It's also important to think about the wider Navy. So, what are our research priorities? What are our doctrinal priorities? What are our intelligence priorities? Um, increasing the dock size. So our dock size is currently 45,000 tons, as is everybody else's, except weirdly for Japan, which is why we're building our Graf Spey uh, over in Japan, because that's nearly 50,000 tons, and that's what the Japanese have. Have a look at our aircraft types because I haven't had a look at them yet. Review our air bases and our airship bases and uh, how our air groups are structured and also review our coastal batteries. Um, we also, I noted as I was having a look through, we have motor torpedo boats around. People a little bit equivocal about MTBs, um, but I think they will uh, certainly in the Baltic be a boon because it's an enclosed, shallow sea with lots of inlets and stuff, so lots of opportunities for MTBs to uh, suddenly appear and be an annoyance. So, a really big to-do list. Let's tick off number one, the one that in many ways is, you know, sort of like the core decision for the entire fleet, certainly for the latter half of the 1930s. Um, what do we do with the Deutschland and the Wettin? If you're new to this and haven't seen episode one, the Graf Spey is a 31 knot battlecruiser, very powerful, reasonably well-rounded, a little bit fast, but that's fine. The Deutschland, uh, the Graf Spey is a 1935 ship. The Deutschland is a 1925 ship, 24 knots, Nelson Rodney kind of design, which I like a lot. And if it was in service, I would absolutely be happy to keep and might spend some money modernized because it can be rebuilt up to a 27 knot ship, maybe 28 if I compromise a lot, um, to give me two fast battleships. But certainly still competitive now, 
but it's not in service. It's under construction, and I will have to spend a lot of money to finish it, and then a lot more money if I decide to modernize it in any particular way. And if the Deutschland is already halfway through its operational life, the Vettin is a 1915 ship and is near the end of its operational life. So the question I posed is, what do I keep? What do I scrap? And if I keep it, do I modernize it? So I gave you four options. Obviously throughout, keep the Graf Spey. Then in this first option, keep the Deutschland, but just keep it as is and run it until its utility uh, ends and scrap the, scrap the vet in. Second option, keep the Graf Spey, of course, keep the Deutschland, keep the vet in, but then put it back into dockyard hands and rebuild it so that it too can become a 24 knot ship and run two 24 knot ships as a, a powerful blockading force, a slow wing to the battle fleet. Um, not, you know, uh, a bad option. And again, if the Vettin had been in service, I might have been willing to spend that money, extra money and extra time in dockyard hands to push it up to 24 knots. Third option, keep the Graf Spey, keep the Deutschland, refit it up to 27 knots and just scrap the Vettin. And then the fourth option, just keep the Graf Spey and scrap the Deutschland, scrap the Vettin. And with the money saved, they'll build another Graf Spey or slightly modified form of the Graf Spey. A massive 25% of everybody who viewed episode one went over to the community tab, which I realize isn't easy in on a, if you watch this on your mobile phone, and voted. So wow, thank you so much for that. The result was 8% for the just let it ride option and scrap the vet in. 6% surprisingly low, I thought, for keep the Deutschland and modernize the vet in and just run the two as a slow wing to the battle fleet and allow the Graf Spey to be the scouting force. 19% for keeping the Deutschland and modernizing it. And a whopping 67% of you hard ass people scrap them both and let's go modern. Um, I, I agree with that. As I said, if the Deutschland and the Vettin had been in service, this would have been a very, very different question. But because I'd have to spend money to build them and then spend money and of course time to rebuild them, then with that money, I just, you know, fancy going and building another Graf Spey. So thanks for everybody who participated in that. And I will be doing that again, introducing some options for you and get get your votes and get your opinions. Lovely to hear all of your comments. A couple of those comments were around, well, why don't you just go and build a CV right now? Why are you delaying the decision uh, to build a CV? And as I've mentioned earlier, I am now actually minded to build a CVL to provide cap for the battle fleet. But the question of battleship versus carrier is a super interesting one. And and it's easy to get your mind sort of catapulted into the future to, you know, 1943, 44 or something and the Pacific Ocean and American ca carrier fleets stomping their way around the Central Pacific. This is not that time. This is 1935 and the carriers currently have 1935 aeroplanes and they are significantly worse. There was a bit of a revolution in aircraft engines in the mid 1930s and late 1930s and early 1940s, uh, all the way up to the creation of jet engines, which transformed the uh, capability of aircraft by, you know, kind of an order of magnitude. The aircraft of 1935 kind of have more in common with First World War aircraft than they do with Second World War aircraft. Um, so I've created this scenario where 
The enemy's been spotted by scout planes 125 nautical miles away, which is, you know, within their abilities. Um, and importantly, it's within the strike distance of carrier aircraft in 1935. And I've created two forces. So I've created a mini little battle fleet of a decent battleship, 10 15 inch guns, and a heavy cruiser, 10 8, and a light cruiser, 10 6 inches, and a little flotilla of destroyers. And I've assumed that once they know there's an enemy 125 nautical miles away, they they beetle along at 25 knots in order to make a fast interception. And I'm pitching that against a carrier that has 30 dive bombers and 30 torpedo bombers. I'm, I'm ignoring the fighters and the carrier's escorts for this exercise. That doesn't really matter. And that the aircraft have a cruising speed of 125 knots, which is, you know, actually quite fair for the aircraft of 1935. I'm also assuming it'll take an hour to load up, fuel up, arm, and form up the strike force. It gives us, in thousands of pounds, 20,000 pound broadside for the 15 inch gun, and a 3,000 pound broadside for the heavy cruiser. And I haven't recorded it here, but actually it's another thousand for the six inch guns and for perhaps the secondary armament of the battleship. An 18,000 pound bomb load for the dive bombers. And then 72 torpedoes between the cruiser and the destroyer and 30 torpedoes between uh, for the uh, torpedo bombers. And what this gives us is this kind of graph where the green is the guns of the fleet, and the orange are the bombs of the carrier, and the gray is the torpedoes of the fleet, and the yellow is the torpedoes of the carrier. And this is, I've called it the payload of a strike flash broadside. This is one of these two fleets firing bang, or launching their weapons at one moment. And as you can see, the carriers, they're smaller, um, but it's quite competitive. It's not, you know, wildly out of the ballpark. And the time on target is quite interesting too. So to go 125 nautical miles for the fleet, shifting along at 25 knots would take five hours. You could be more sedate and go at 20 knots and save your fuel a bit, but um, and that would take you six hours, obviously, but, um, you know, five hours is a fair chunk of time. It will take the carrier two hours, an hour to form up, arm and all of that, and an hour to fly out there. Um, and so you, you kind of get the feeling that the carrier is a weaker but still serious weapon at this point. But the wider context is that um, their effectiveness isn't on this, the single broadside. It is throughout the day. I've used North European daytime and nighttime. Um, if you're in America, you may not readily realize just how far North Europe is. We're on the same latitude of kind of Northern Canada. Um, were kept temperate by the Gulf Stream. And so in the summertime, we get, you know, 16 hours of daylight and eight hours of nighttime. Actually, on the longest day of the year, it can sometimes barely get dark. And in the wintertime, that's flipped over. The battle fleet can deliver across that day two and a half million pounds of uh, shells two and a half million pounds one battleship and a heavy cruiser and a light cruiser 72 destroyers the carrier can probably mount about four strikes uh for 72 000 pounds of bomb load and maybe 90 torpedoes i don't think the carrier would carry the full number 
the full 120 torpedoes. Carriers run out of torpedoes, they're quite precious. At night time, that's brought down to, it's still the same stuff, you've just got a short range. Whereas the carrier, I've called it ineffective. Now, carriers have just invented uh, nighttime air operations. But of course, nighttime air operations require nighttime spotting, which is problematic. Um, once radar comes along, then that could be a much more effective thing. But that's, you know, the best part of 10 years away or eight years away or something like that. Oddly enough, it does mean that a carrier force could attack a known fixed target, say, I don't know, Taranto, uh, as the Royal Navy did, um, but actually attacking a moving fleet in the middle of the night with just an eyeball isn't really going to go very well until radar comes along. In the wintertime, the battleship can still deliver this two and a half million pounds worth of shells. I'm assuming a loadout of 100 shells per gun, by the way, and 72 torpedoes. And the carrier is probably restricted to just two strikes in daytime. By the way, I said it takes two hours to load up and travel out to the target. But of course, it takes another hour to get back and another hour to strike down and then reload. So I'm assuming a cadence of around four hours between strikes. That might be a little pessimistic. You might get away with three hours, but you know, it's the point that I'm trying to get across really. So the carrier here in daytime would only be able to do two strikes, maybe three and have your third strike landing at nighttime with all of the uh, accident problems that's attendant. And again, at nighttime, the battleship is still effective, still obviously very short range, and the carrier force is ineffective. Now, what that actually means is that this is the payload for an entire day. This is what two and a half million pounds worth of shell looks like against the combined bomb load of the carriers, and this is the daytime figure, against the fleet torpedoes, against the carrier torpedoes, assuming the carrier carries enough. Now, what happens if the time on target is different? Let's double the distance, as would be common in 1943, up to 250 miles. Well, now it takes 10 hours for the fleet to get there, and it takes probably three hours for the carrier strike force to get there. Then the calculation is, well, yeah, sure, if the battleship ever gets there, the weight of projectiles that it can deliver is absolutely monumental. But in getting there, it may have to face three carrier strikes. And if the carriers achieve enough hits, the battleship will never get there. So if you fast forward, this calculation carrier versus battleship becomes different. For now, in 35, the carrier is definitely secondary to the battleship in terms of offensive capability. It is, of course, absolutely essential in terms of scouting, or aircraft are essential in terms of scouting, and that has revolutionized uh, naval warfare. It, uh, you know, scouting is like the least glamorous thing in the world, but it's the difference between a Jutland and a Matapan, for example. Uh, at Jutland, all the scouting through all the mist and smoke was done uh, from people uh, up in a bridge or in a fire control station. Yes, there was one plane zooming around try trying to tell BT what was going on, but, you know, the technology was right at the very dawn and it didn't work. Fast forward, and the ability to have aeroplanes searching a monumentally large amount of ocean to then vector in your battle fleet or vector in your strike force completely changed everything. So carriers are extremely important and they only will get more important, but just now they are seconds, I believe, to the battleship. Feel free to comment uh, about all of that. So let's get back to the fleet. Let's zoom in here. And I've uh, 
I've just got my to-do list off to the side on another screen so I can check. So Deutschland, farewell. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, a little bit of money for scrapping. Thank you very much. And Vettin. Goodbye. Rubbish. Okay. Next thing. Uh, whoops. Not build a ship. Let's design a ship. Let's design at least glamorous of all ships, a set of corvettes. Let's bring it down, whoops, to 600 tons. Let's make it all importantly a minesweeper. Guns, four inch, reduce the AA down to zero. They shouldn't be operating within hostile air environment and carrier aircraft should completely ignore them. The speed at 22, I think is, um, wasted really for cost so at 22 it's 145 if i take that down to 19 it's 134 cheapest chip ships they they don't have to do very much i don't really need anything else from this i would put it in colonial service if we had a colony but we don't the only other thing is making it into long range is a thing that does take the cost up quite substantially but it does make it a more effective escort however it's primarily a minesweeper for the Baltic and the North Sea rather than a convoy escort. So I'm going to keep it at medium, 35, and let's click OK. Uh, fire control's not the best type. Kel surprise. Let's OK that and get that going. So that's our distinctly poor set of um, minesweeping capability sorted. Next up is divisions. So divisions allow you to group ships together and they allow a commander to be assigned. So here is our list of officers. I will uh, organize them by rank. We have Frigatenkapitän and Kapitän Zuzi. Frigatenkapitän is lieutenant commander in the uh, Royal Navy. Kapitän Zuzi is full captain and you can see here the full captains are commanding cruisers the forgotten captain is commanding light cruisers we haven't got any rear admirals because we haven't got any heavy ships for them to command just yet but once we organize it these into divisions uh, they will have one of these people assigned as a rear admiral to lead that as you can see they have a number of years in service uh, they have no battles fought. They have no ability, sort of high, low, medium, all of that kind of stuff. They have no special abilities. These will become apparent over the following years of service. You can remove a rubbish captain or admiral from your ship or division, but it does cost you prestige points because you're monkeying around with the promotion system and that upsets other people because you know it was my turn to be admiral or i have the seniority to command that ship it can be worthwhile if you have a very bad one and you need to take it out and replace it with a much better one so that's them in a nutshell if we go over to the ships in service usually i would organize these by similar classes, particularly similar speeds. First of all, we have these Stuttgarts with only five inch guns, these tiny little 4,000 ton light cruisers. So they're gonna go in their own thing. I'm not putting them with anybody else. Then we have the Munchens and the Hamburgs. Uh, they're at 31 and 32 knots. And then we have the quite old Bremens, which are 29 knots. So I'm gonna put the Hamburgs and the munchens together and then I am going to put the Bremens together and then I need a third light cruiser squadron division I'm going to add the Stuttgarts to them okay that's all of them the destroyers. Now we have a lot of destroyers, so I'm just going to do this off camera for a moment. Okay. Um, 
as with many of the dialog box here, it's not necessarily the most intuitive, but never mind. So we have the first cruiser division with all the heavy cruisers, the first light cruiser division with the best of the light cruisers, the second with the two old ones, and the third with the tiny ones. We have the uh, first, second, third, and fourth destroyer divisions with all the modern plus 1,000 ton destroyers. The sub 1,000 ton destroyers are going to be on trade protection, so I'm going to leave them out of this command structure. I right, collapse them all. The importance of this is that you can give them a role. So if I right click and set the role, let's bring that in here. The role for the heavy cruisers for the moment is going to be the fleet flagship. Obviously that will change once we have a, uh, a Graf Spey in service. I'm going to click OK for that. And the role for the modern light cruisers is going to be could be independent, in which case they go off and they do their own thing. Certainly could be scouting, which is, you know, what light cruisers are really meant to do to obviously supplement what um, aircraft can do. It could do screening, but for light cruisers, that's really what destroyers are for. They could be support, which means they usually stay to the disengaged side of combat and then rush in at various points. Um, to launch torpedoes classically, uh, or they could be part of the core, so they could follow behind the first cruiser squadron and effectively be part of the battle line. I'm going to set them to scout, and their lead division is, of course, the uh, the first cruiser. The old ones, uh, I'm going to set their role to be... Hmm, they're probably not very good as scouts. They're a little bit slow. It's problematic for a scout. Uh, ditto for a screen. So it's certainly too weak to be core, but it would mean either support or independent. I'm going to set them to independent. And again, they are supporting the first cruisers. The third, I am possibly going to give these, actually, let me just check their speed. So the 31, so the reasonable speed, they can keep up. So let's set their role to be part of the screen. And again, of the first cruiser division. Actually, no, I'm gonna set that for one of the destroyers. So I'm gonna set them as supports. For the destroyers, the main thing is to screen and, of course, screen the first cruiser division. The second, I'm going to set them in a support role. And the third division, I will set them to support the um, first light cruiser division. And then finally, I am going to set the role of this group to help out the second cruiser division and support them. Okay, so this is a relatively unsophisticated organization. It's almost worthwhile working this out on a piece of paper. And as my fleet gets more complicated, I probably will diagram it out for you. But it creates these divisions, and these divisions are assigned roles to support other divisions all the way up to the core and the flagship. And it means that when the battle gen generator creates a force, it respects these orders primarily rather than just making stuff up. I mean, of course, you can make stuff up too, but on the whole, this is um, a nice way of having a little bit of control, so 50%, 75% control over how the fleet is deployed. You can see here on the nuns, there is experience and there's a commanding officer. They are going to be automatically appointed um, shortly over the next month or two. That's setting up the divisions. 
Next on my list was, am I going to put any of these in reserve or am I going to put any of these into mothball? So I'm going to put all of the trade protection vessels into reserve. In Rulerways 2, you'd have just automatically put these in mothballs and thought nothing of it and then just activated it when war came. If you do that, your crew quality will be poor and that will actually degrade your anti-submarine warfare value and it will take them half a year uh, or more to become good. So you can't just play loose and fancy with the quality of your trade protection vessels anymore. You need to really bring them out of reserve or mothballs if you put them in mothballs before the war starts in order to uh, allow them to uh, get up to a decent crew quality in order to perform their trade protection role properly. Next up, I'm probably going to put these old Bremens into reserve as well. This, by the way, is very handy. This maintenance figure, I'm now at 4,274. This second box, 4,600, is how much it would cost if everything was active. I'm saving three and a bit hundred a month, which is not huge, but every little helps. I'm reluctant to put any of the others into reserve mainly because of the geopolitics. If I go to the map and zoom in on Europe, you can see, actually if I just zoom out a little bit more, there is Finland, Norway and Iceland all up for grabs as territories. One thing I hadn't noticed in the previous episode is that I actually own the Baltic States. A bonus, which gives me quite a few ports and quite a lot of opportunities for air bases and coastal batteries and MTBs and stuff like that in the Baltic. And is certainly a reason why I might deploy the fleet to the Baltic, because Finland might come up. Obviously, if Norway or Iceland comes up, well, that's a shame. But um, but yeah, that's a, an interesting possibility. So I'm going to keep it at that, quite light. So I've decided to move this lot into the Baltic. Splitting the fleet? Mm. Discuss. Uh, interest in your ideas. Obviously it's a weak fleet and the Soviet Union or Britain or indeed France may get first uh, dibs on whether any of these neutral territories come up or not. But, you know, that's the thing. Next up is some new builds. So I guess having decided to um, get rid of the other battleships, I really need to create a new battleship. And there's two choices, really. The first is just to go and buy another Graf Spey. And if we go to build ship and go by displacement, that will cost us 6,200. Okay. Um, which is, you know, put us slightly into negative balance, but I'm expecting the budget to uh, rise throughout the year, which is fair enough. Or, I could create a more modest copy locally. Modest because our dock size is only 45,000 tons, not the 50,000 needed for a full graph spay. It depends on our relationship with Japan. At the moment, that's at four. I would love for that to go down. and I will be certainly concentrating on that going down over the next few months. Let's open up the design and see what we can get if we bring this down to a mere 45,000 tons. Obviously that puts us nearly 2,000 tons overweight. We'll put it into a, a local yard, which actually knocks off quite a bit, 1,600. So we gain 400 tons just by building it locally. So the Japanese have a big dock, but their technology is actually inferior to our own in the main. That's one thing. I want to keep the overall profile as close as possible. First of all, I could go down to 15 inch guns. That takes out 700, which is great. I can take the conning tower down to two inches. Obviously, this is in no way uh, the Graf Spey anymore. 
I will have to spend money on developing a, a whole new design. Let's call this Bra from Stauffenberg, just to balance up the slightly dodgy nature of playing Germany in 1935. Obviously, von Stauffenberg was the, uh, the guy who left the briefcase in the July 1944 bomb plot against Hitler. So taking down the conning tower to just a splinter proof two inches, takes it down to 260. So we're getting pretty close without having to compromise very much at the moment. Yes, the rounds per gun are a bit light. Um, I can go and I can get rid of the aircraft because they probably don't belong on a battleship. Um, I would love them to be on a seaplane carrier or on a light cruiser with a significant number of scout aircraft on them to be designed soon. Obviously that will only take about 22 months. This will take something like 33. So I could run this for a year and then build the seaplane carrier and build the light cruiser and still have it enter service at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm liking it. I, I can't see, it is a mini me of the grass spay, but not ridiculously so. 66 tons is a little bit light. I'd like it a little bit more to fit the radars and so on. But 36 heavy anti-aircraft factors and reasonable light and medium is fine. 10 15 inch guns, perfectly serviceable and respectable. So I'm happy with that. It doesn't have any torpedoes. I do usually like to give it torpedoes, not to really use, but so that I can see what the torpedo range is when I'm fighting a battle and um, not get into too much trouble. I can see the torpedo danger zone. But if I added them, it would take me down to just six tons. I do like to leave a reserve of weight remaining, as I say, for changes to technology and upgrades of fire control and all of that. Let's just see how it's fine. Um, all right, we have, um, we have some leftovers. Oh, we have a hanger. Okay, well, that didn't save us anything whatsoever. So that's all okay. Hmm. I had really wanted to increase the deck armor to five inches. Obviously, reducing the guns means that the immunity zone is now a bit more considerable for a comparable ship. I could lower the speed and that would give us quite a bit. Even just one knot would give us a thousand tons. Hmm. Now that does actually seem to be quite a significant gain. And Germany's not normally the kind of country that uh, suffers from ships entering service, but not actually able to achieve their design speed. I'm looking at you, France. So with that, I can keep the torpedoes. I can up the number of shells to 110, which I'm much happier with. I can um, just add a little bit more to this usable space. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm happier with that. That seems like a, a good compromise and the loss of one knot doesn't, shouldn't be too significant. And we might have a 30 knot fleet. And indeed for the Graf Spey, if I ever go around modernizing it, bearing in mind that it's um, incredibly overweight at the moment, being able to chop a knot would be a reasonable saving. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with this. This is more sustainable. I'm not dependent on uh, being sweet with the Japanese. I can build them here and yeah. So I'm going to finish that. And yes, sorry about the 9,000 it's going to take to uh, design it but that's that's a sustainable amount I go over because forty five thousand is obviously a hard limit at the moment i'm going to build some new dock yards in the early game you get private construction pushing up the shipyards you get tend to get that much less in uh, the later game so you have to you know bite the bullet and buy that yourself now, I haven't fully got through my to-do list, but I've made a very good start. So I'm going to end it just right now. 
So thanks very much for watching and see you in the next episode.